I want to say hi to everyone. My name is Angie Chang, the founder of Girl Geek X. And welcome to Girl Geek and Open Door Dinner. I'd like to spend just a few minutes chatting with you all about how you can start or continue cultivating a successful career by prioritizing your own self-awareness. One of the things I love about Open Door is seeing that demonstration of leadership every day with every single person I work with. Um, and, you know, I've personally seen that leadership demonstrated by these particular panelists. Really keeping in mind that execution matters. It's not all about like coming up with cool ideas. We need to keep a high bar for what we do. There's no shortage of good ideas, only people to make those ideas a reality. I'm going to um, give you a flavor of the type of problem and the project data scientists are uh, uh, working with at, at Open Door. Specifically, this is a multiple hypothesis testing problem. On the seller team at Opener, we actually build out a variety of customer experiences and dashboards, which span from educating the customer on buying, a, buying and or selling their home all the way through actually like digitally closing on their home. Thank you all for sharing your insights and your journeys with us. Um, really enjoyed all the talks and the conversation about this is what leadership looks like. So I think we are going live with our Open Door Girl Geek Dinner. Um, I want to say hi to everyone. We have, uh, I see people joining us. Can you chat to us uh, where you're coming in from? So I'm coming in from Berkeley, California. How about you, Sukruta? Hi, everyone. I'm Sukruta. I am dialed in from Yosemite this weekend. Awesome. So yeah, just quick intros. Uh, my name is Angie Chang, the founder of Girl Geek X. Um, and when we started Girl Geek Dinners over a decade ago, I was the only female engineer at a startup. And I really just wanted to meet other women in tech. And I started asking companies to host Girl Geek Dinners so that we can go to different companies and hear from the women on stage about what they're working on. And then also be able to meet other amazing people like yourselves, which we'll be doing um, at seven after the talks. Um, and I was able to meet people like Sukruta. So Sukruta, why don't you use, uh, tell us a bit about you and what you're up to? Yeah, so I mean, I met Angie because I was looking for um, things to do outside of work. And that's how I ended up finding out about Girl Geek Dinners and Angie. Um, honestly, I think everybody is craving, you know, um, a network now more than ever and this is part of why like us doing it virtual makes it possible so we encourage you to uh, have your respective the company that you work at to sponsor a girl geek dinner uh, we hope that at some point in the near future we'll be able to see you all in real life uh, by day I also work at a large uh, company namely Salesforce. <laughs> and we're also uh, transitioning back into the office. So, you know, the way people are working right now is so different. We can work from anywhere. Um, so we should also be able to network from anywhere. So yeah, I look forward to tonight's content and the speakers are all amazing. So over to you, Angie. So um, while we wait, we have a few minutes to say some things. So I wanted to quickly say um, we... Uh, some things that we've done since we started, we have a virtual conference every International Women's Day called Elevate, and it's March 8th, um, and it will be again March 8th on 2022. And all the talks are recorded and hosted at youtube.com slash girlgeekx. So you can actually find all those conference talks, all the Girl Geek dinner events, and tonight's talks. If you have to drop off, go make dinner, um, we totally take uh, understand that. So um, everything's available on YouTube later in case you can't stay for the entire hour or two. Um, and pro tip, look at the playlists because they're actually categorized into like different things like career journeys, management, engineering, machine learning. And you can kind of dig into what you're interested in and see what other girl geeks have spoken about over the years on those topics. Um, we also have a podcast. So if you like to listen, like I do, um, we have two seasons, I believe, of podcasts and we have another season coming out this summer. So stay tuned for that. We'll have some new content coming out. And then we also are going to be contributing to our local community here in the San Francisco Bay Area and adopting a middle school slash high school and really contributing to enriching and helping 
kind of support the students there who are um, interested in STEM. So stay, in, uh, stay on the lookout for news on that. That's another opportunity where we can see you and hopefully engage you with some students and get them inspired to stay in STEM. So uh, a quick note, I wanna kind of say who is here tonight. I looked at our attendee list about half an hour ago and I saw that uh, we have about 45% of you have over a decade of work experience. So often when I go to networking events, people always say, oh, everyone's junior or they're like, they just got out of college or they're looking for their first job out of a boot camp. They, that might be true, that, may, that might not be true. But also at the same time, there's a lot of really, I would call mid-career people who are out there and continue to come back to these events. So I really say thank you for coming back and continuing to dig in and learn more about companies and the people that work at them. And I'm really excited that tonight we are gonna be listening to the women at Open Door. If you haven't heard of Open Door, it is a real estate startup uh, company. And I'm sure the women will be talking more about what they've been working on at Open Door. So I'm gonna turn it over to them, the experts. Our first speaker, the keynote speaker is Morgan Cole. And Morgan Cole joined Open Door in 2017, where she's helped many, many customers transition to their dream homes and served as a people leader for sales and support. And she's currently supporting the learning and development team as a senior trainer and curriculum specialist with an emphasis on instructional design, internal partner relations and creative problem solving across multiple organizations. So when she is navigating the world of L&D, you can find her spending time with her Sour Patch pup, Arthur. So welcome, Morgan. Hello, thank you so much for the warm welcome, Angie. I really appreciate that. I am gonna go ahead and share my screen and then we'll go ahead and get rolling. All right, and can you see that okay? Yes. Very good. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Girl Geek and Open Door Dinner. Uh, my name is Morgan Cole, and I'd like to spend just a few minutes uh, chatting with you all about how you can start uh, or continue cultivating a successful career by prioritizing your own self-awareness. Now, before we dive in, I should share just one quick tidbit about myself. I am a words of affirmation girl. It is the love language that rivals all others in my book. Uh, so that said, I am going to need your help just to make sure we're all on the same page this evening. So if you all are ready to kick off this conversation, just take two seconds for me and go ahead and type the word yes, Y-E-S in the chat box at the bottom of your screen, just to know, let me know you're ready to rock and roll. Go ahead and type Y-E-S. Ooh, they are trickling in. I like it. Very good. Very good. That was a test and you all passed with flying colors. Uh, so let's do it. So a few years ago, uh, Dr. Tasha Yurich, who is a best-selling author, she's a psychologist and founder of the Yurich Group, uh, her and her team, they conducted a study with nearly about 5,000 participants. And the purpose of this study was to better understand the meaning of self-awareness. Okay. Here we are. Um, and the research team's findings, they were actually pretty astounding. They learned that there are actually two types of self-awareness. The first one is internal self-awareness, and the second is external self-awareness. Now, the thing to note here is that these are not mutually exclusive, meaning it is possible to possess one or both types. Now, before I dive into each type of awareness and the role that it plays in our professional and in our personal lives, I'm curious to know your thoughts on this next question. So if you look on your screen here, you'll see the question reads, how many people do you believe are actually self-aware to some degree? Do you think it's A, 10 to 15 percent of people, B, 15 to 20 percent? C, 20 to 30 percent, or D, 30 to 40 percent? If you had to guess, how many people do you think are actually self-aware? Go ahead and type in A, B, C, or D in the chat box for me and let me know your thoughts. I see, oh, a handful trickling. It's a mixed bag. Very good. Thank you all so much for the responses. I appreciate that. So while you all are still continuing to put in your, your choices, I'll tell you, the not so fantastic news is that the average human believes they're self-aware, 
but only 10 to 15% of those people actually fit the criteria. So the good news is that self-awareness is a learned behavior. What that means is that we can strive to inch just a little bit closer to fully understanding how we tick and what truly motivates us and how to dissect the depth of our perceptions of the world around us. And it also aids in stronger leadership competencies, too. So going back to the two types of self-awareness I spoke about a few seconds ago, let's explore internal self-awareness first. Now, internal self-awareness, it represents how clearly we see our own values and passions and aspirations, your thoughts, your feelings, um, and your impact on others. And, you know, studies have shown that this type of awareness correlates with higher job and relationship satisfaction, as well as just general happiness. Meanwhile, external self-awareness, it represents understanding other people's perceptions of our value systems and our thoughts or our feelings, right? So essentially, folks that drift toward external self-awareness, they typically understand how others view them, and they're more skilled at showing empathy and taking in other people's perspectives as a result. So the takeaway here is that it's most impactful to try to strike a balance between both subtypes of awareness, rather than over-indexing on one or the other. Because here's the truth, being crystal clear about who you innately are, your own behavior patterns, and what you need and want is a form of leadership. So self-awareness, it catapults your ability to clearly articulate your desires and ask for help in forging the appropriate path to get you there. So this next slide, it's a quick map that actually breaks down four self-awareness archetypes, which is basically like how we present to the world based on the depth of internal or external self-awareness that we possess. So I'm going to save you a bit of time and I'm just going to give you a quick overview of these four categories. So no need to read through each line. So the top left quadrant, it shows how high internal self-awareness and low external self-awareness is typically referred to as introspectors. And it depicts people who clearly understand themselves, but they rarely challenge their own views. And in some cases, this particular quadrant can limit their interpersonal relationships. Now, the bottom left quadrant symbolizes seekers. These are folks with low internal and external awareness. And people that are currently navigating this quadrant, they might be in a state of self-discovery and may perhaps be a bit unsettled or in a state of flux in their personal or professional lives. Now, going over to the bottom right quadrant, Low internal and high external awareness, those are telltale signs of a people pleaser. This means that someone may be hyper-focused on how other people view them, sometimes to the detriment of their own personal or professional contentment. And in many instances, folks that work through this category, they're known to make decisions that are not always in service of their own success. And in some respects, it can be considered a self-saboteur. And last, uh, but certainly not least, at the top right quadrant, that depicts high internal and external awareness, which insinuates that a person is keenly aware about themselves or the external environment, and they value candid feedback from other people. There was a study specifically from Gallup um, that showed people in this particular category are generally proven to be good leaders in a plethora of environments environments because they intentionally seek out balance and inter and intrapersonal skills. So those are the four archetypes. Now with those four archetypes in mind and in the spirit of bravery and transparency and leadership, I would love for you all to just take a few seconds just to think about which one of those four categories 
you believe you are currently in in your career. Go ahead and just write it out on a sticky note or perhaps the note section on your phone or a piece of scratch paper, whatever you have nearby in your home. Um, and this is only for your personal use. But take a look at those four categories and jot down which category you believe you're currently in. Okay. Now, I wouldn't ask you all to do anything that I wasn't willing to do. So in my case, I'm actually going to share my self-awareness experience aloud. Okay. So full transparency, uh, I toggle between being aware and the people pleaser. I do. Um, and I'll share an example that clearly depicts this. Uh, two of my former leaders at Open Door, they taught me very early on in my career that in order to gain sustainable success, it was going to be my responsibility to always ask questions, to always raise my hand for help, and to speak up and finish what I started. But here's the only problem with that. I interpreted most of those tasks as signs of weakness almost like a, a bird's eye view of my professional inadequacies or inefficiencies. And let me just tell you this, thank goodness for patient and nurturing leaders because it took about two years for me to really get over this hump. And while it sounds a little half-witted for me to say now, I truly believed asking questions or raising my hand for help would inadvertently highlight the things that I had not yet mastered. And my aha moment was, that's the point, Morgan. <laughs> that's the point. I needed to acknowledge the things that I had not mastered because you can't fix what's hidden and you can't practice what you refuse to acknowledge. So when I finally came to terms with what was holding me back, myself, you know, I held on to this quote from Thomas Edison that I love. And it reads, having a vision for what you want in life is not enough. Vision without execution is hallucination. So while I could go on and on about this topic for days, I do know that time is of the essence, but I want to leave you all uh, with a parting gift. Okay. So I challenge each of you to take about 30 seconds. And I want you to recall a book or an author or a podcast, um, or perhaps maybe even an article that has been especially helpful in building your leadership skills or self-awareness or interpersonal skills, anything that has helped you in your career. So go ahead and take a few seconds to just think of that one resource, or maybe there's a few of them that you always go to when somebody asks you for a recommendation. And once you have that resource in mind, I would love it if all of you can go ahead and type it in the chat box below for me. And while you all are typing and putting in your resources, I'm going to share three books that have been especially impactful for me. Now, the first one is called The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. It's really a good book about getting out of your own way. And it was really helpful for me about a year and a half ago. The second one is a person that we all know and love, Brene Brown's Dare to Lead. It's a classic. I, I would venture to say reading it once a year is always a good idea. I always get gems from Dare to Lead. And the last book that I have loved um, is actually called Get Over It by Ian Van Zant. It's a really great self-help book that talks from a professional and a personal standpoint about removing yourself from yourself so that you can present your best self when you are in a professional setting. So just to recap, my top three books, The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks, Dare to Lead by Brene Brown, and then Get Over It by Ian Van Zandt. Now, let me see what you all have in the chat box here. I've got a couple coming in. The Power of Gentleness. Oh, very good. Thinking Fast and Slow. Thank you all. Continue to go ahead and put them in as you see uh, fit. And as, as books and articles come to mind, please continue to trickle them in for me. Um, this is actually my first time reading about some of these titles. So thank you. Thank you to everybody who's sharing so openly. You know, this chat is chock full of resources and it's an endless gift to each of us. You know, there's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, 
go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And tonight's conversation and your willingness to offer resources to cultivate your peers will continue to build an equitable bridge between different ethnicities, self-identified genders, and neurological differences in this ever-evolving world of business. So take that sticky note or that note on your phone with your self-awareness type on it that I mentioned earlier and the plethora of resources that you now have in this chat box. And I would love for all of you to use it as a first step to discovering how you can continue to evolve into the best version of yourself in business and in life. So thank you all so much for your open hearts and your listening ears and collaboration and huge thanks to Girl Geek Team for cultivating a platform that acknowledges and celebrates women in tech. I am so, so appreciative. So for our next speaker, I would love to introduce the one and only Annie Tang. Annie is a senior design manager for Seller at Open Door, where she works on drastically simplifying the home selling experience. And in her time at Open Door, Annie has worked on designing various aspects of the Open Door consumer experience, like trade-ins, buying and mortgages. But outside of that, she loves to hang out with her sweet pup. So without further ado, Annie, I'm going to pass it off to you. All right, here we go. Sorry, don't use Zoom every day. Oh my gosh, Morgan, that was such an amazing and inspiring um, talk. Uh, this is actually not my first time hearing it from Morgan, but actually I was feel inspired the second time around too. And it really got me thinking about the internal um, self-awareness piece, especially because I think, you know, as we think about self-awareness, it's easy to think about the external piece, at least for me. Um, and so this really got me thinking about the internal piece. And so um, with that, I'll transition over to my talk for the day. Um, and that is about design and strategy at Open Door. Um, so like Morgan said, I'm the senior design manager uh, for Seller. Seller is one of our teams here at Open Door, and I manage the team of designers that work on that experience for our customers. A little bit about me, I started out in architecture, so did not study design, um, UX design at all, um, and you know, uh, worked at a couple of various uh, larger scale companies before I found my way to Open Door. Um, and the reason why I joined Open Door about four and a half years ago was really I wanted to work on a very complex real world problem. And at the time, it was a pretty small startup. And I was really excited by the opportunities that it gave. But most importantly, I was really excited to design for online and offline experiences where I wasn't really selling an app or an interface, but I was actually thinking through, you know, selling a service that included both the digital experience and a real world component to it. And that felt really exciting to me. And so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about design. And before I get into it, I wanted to get a uh, signal maybe in the chat. You can throw in the chat if you guys, any of you guys have been watching Mythic Quest. Um, it's been a favorite around our house lately. Um, see, Angie definitely has. A couple other people. I have personally been loving it. My uh, husband and I really love to watch this show. One gripe I will say that I do have about this is that it really centers around this myth of the creative genius. You know, you've got this creative director who over the course of the night comes up with like these amazing, you know, visions for the new game. And, you know, the art directing team just like creates it and there's no research or anything and makes for great TV. But unfortunately, that is not really how uh, design actually works in real life. Um, and so, you know, over the course of designing in, in my design career, what I realized is core for design and for product design, actually, and creating products is that, you know, the geniusness of coming up with the ideas isn't actually the hard part. Um, and it's a good thing and a bad thing. It means that, you know, even if you feel like you're not like an ideas person and you don't have that, like it's, it's not the end all be all to being a designer. And also at the same time, being a designer doesn't mean that you're just the one coming up with ideas and other people execute. Um, so a lot of being a designer is validating the idea, effectively communicating across the company and figuring out how to build it out. And so I'm gonna go over that a little bit with um, a two-part agenda. So I'll talk through some of the principles that we have within um, the design team at Open Door that help guide us to make sure that we're really being diligent about how we design for our customers. And then I'll also walk through a case study for what we did um, for our seller experience last year where we redesigned 
um, the spirit they experience end to end when COVID hit and really helped our customers figure out a way to sell their home um, faster and on their own time. So principle number one that I have with our team is we always start with research. We never forget the data. So every idea should be backed by reasons why people's lives will be better with it. So what we do is we spend a lot of time talking to our customers, our users to discover problems and validate possible solutions before even we even get into any kind of ideating phase. So it's really important for us to really empathize with our customers and really understand what those needs are. Um, a couple of ways that we do this at a high level is qualitative research and quantitative research. On the qualitative level, that's really talking to our customers, doing user interviews, and you know, an insight that we might get out of qualitative research could be something like what we have here, which is you know, meet Linda. Linda is looking to sell her home and buy a new one. She is completely overwhelmed with the process of coordinating two transactions to line up her move, and that's that the buy and sell transactions. So we're trying to, we're kind of like talking to customers and really getting at what is really um, difficult for them in their process. Quantitative research, you know, is really about, you know, sizing this opportunity. So could mount in something like this, like Linda, 70% of home sellers in the United States are simultaneously buying and selling a home at the same time. This basically tells us, okay, so this is a real need. And actually a ton of people are experiencing this need. And so that really centers around a, a problem that we can obsess over then that we can ideate upon. So the second principle that we really um, adhere to is first visualize the experience, not just the UI. So I've worked with tons of designers over my career and you know, designers junior and senior when I've seen so many uh, folks, when we get a new prompt or we get a new idea, we immediately hit the pixels and we you know, design out a shiny experience and it's really, really amazing. We forget that actually the customer needs to be the star of the story. It's not about the UI. Um, and so what we really emphasize is when we start thinking about new ideas or solving problems, we think about the story, we think about the customer and how they, they experience the flow from end to end. And sometimes we do storyboards like this, sometimes we do flow charts, but it's really about putting the customer at the forefront of the story first, and then the UI and the, the pixels kind of fall to support that. So here's you know, an example um, of some work that we do when we put together um, flows and comps. Um, you'll see that we have like the digital experience, but also in our first, we have you know, images that support kind of telling a story of what happens in real life. You know, we've got text updates and someone on the couch receiving them. We've got like a walkthrough prep um, and imagining that a customer is cleaning their home and getting ready for a walkthrough before they log onto their mobile app to do that walkthrough. So really putting it situational with the designs is really core to how we try to think about designing new products. And then the last principle that we have is really that execution matters and we sweat the details. Again, design isn't just about the idea and the strategy. It's equally important is the craft and the execution. Actually, a lot of times what I've seen is, you know, the idea might be the final idea that gets executed might not be, you know, the most novel thing, but the, if we execute it really well and really diligent about it and we track it and we learn from it, that's really what makes a product successful. So what we really enforce is every detail, every pixel of experience matters, not just the strategy, but also like, you know, exactly how we execute it so that we're delivering a high quality experience to um, our end customers. So with those principles, I'm going to walk you guys through a tactical kind of case study to kind of bring this life and show you guys at a high level how we um, go about big design projects at Open Door. So what this case study is at a high level, um, I'm going to walk you through how we ended up designing a centralized dashboard for our Open Door experience, where the design team created a vision to unify several parts of our experience, which guided a lot of the product roadmap throughout 2020. So starting with the problems and the research, so what did we find? So in 2019, throughout the course of the year, what we found is that our experience at Open Door was just really disjointed. Customers were telling us that they were getting dead ends, that there was a lot of long wait times in between parts of the experience. 
And one thing that we, you know, give to our customers is they come to us and we give them an offer on their home. But there was a really long wait time and they didn't know what was coming up next. There was a lot of scheduling coordination going on. So there's a lot of things happening and no, you know, a lot of dead ends and people didn't really know what the next step was. And that was really impacting our customer experience. So at the end of 2019, we did is we got a uh, together a group of cross-functional leaders, PMs, designers, engineers, and operators, and we did a sprint um, over the course of a week. And what we really wanted to do was figure out a strategy to solve those problems that we have identified from our research team and try to help to come up with a visualization of an end state, um, a future state that, that we want to aim towards by the end of the year that would solve all the identified problems that we had. And that would hopefully guide our work. Um, and that way we can break it out into chunks that we can kind of slowly build towards over the course of the year. And so the output of that sprint, um, what we created was a single narrative for that end state. So what we actually did was we created a deck that included you know, um, uh, pieces like the images that we see on the right, where we actually just laid out a story for our customer, Jill, who was looking to buy and sell. And we put together, you know, a couple screens, but they, but really focusing on the story and how she feels and what she's interacting with. So we created this vision deck. And we actually tested a couple of these high-level concepts with potential customers. Um, what we aimed to do was we really want to show strong concepts that were new to the experience that, you know, we could refine at a later time. But it was really about thinking about this new experience for our customer, Jill, that would um, solve all of her needs by the end of the year. A couple of the big ideas that came out of this was the idea for the open door dashboard where we would centralize all of these disjointed experiences into one place where our customers can come back to see what's next. Um, but a couple of different ideas too was like this idea of an instant offer. You know, previously we were having customers wait 24, 48 hours. What if we can give them an instant offer as they were telling us information about their home, we, could, you, we can update you know, their offer live? Um, what if we could give them clear milestones? Like a, uh, we always call internally, we call a pizza tracker, kind of like the Domino's pizza tracker. But what if we could make it super clear like that for every stage of the buying and selling process on their dashboard? Um, another, another big pain point was that, you know, customers were having to schedule these inspections and figure out how to line up having people come to their homes. So what if we leverage technology and help customers do self-guided inspections where they could just upload a couple of photos of their home and we could do the inspection without having to actually go into their, go into their home. So all of these ideas um, kind of, you know, culminated into this vision deck. And what was really cool that came out of it is once we had an aligned vision for we were wanting to go towards it, go towards for the end of the year, um, we could then, you know, formulate a roadmap and piece off different projects that each team would then take to work towards, you know, that vision. And we could get really tactical and figure out you know, what the right way to execute towards it would be. And the great thing about this is that the sub teams then had kind of a more or less unified idea of like where we wanted to head towards um, and build towards for the year. So these are just some screens about how we sweated the details. You know, we started from um, each project then, you know, went through various rounds of research and low fidelity kind of mocks on the left side to high fidelity mocks on the right side. Um, ultimately whittling down to one experience that we ultimately shipped. Um, and with that, um, we're actually going to save, I have Q&A on here, but we're actually going to save Q&A until the very end. But that's it on kind of an example of how we design an open door, both on like a principal level and also in terms of like the case study. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce Amy. Um, Amy is a senior data scientist on the advanced analytics team at Opendoor. Her responsibilities include defining and leading pragmatic casual learning practice at a company level using advanced experimentation, inference, and decision science techniques. So welcome, Amy. Hi, everybody. First, uh, thank you, Amy, for the uh, great showcase of uh, all the cool design work uh, your team have been working on. Uh, I'm a, data, a senior data scientist at Open Door. I'm going to um, give you a flavor of the type of problem and the project data scientists are, are working with at, at Open Door. Specifically, this is a multiple hypothesis testing problem. As you all know, this uh, multiple hypothesis testing problem uh, means when we do more statistical tests, 
we are more likely to make a type one error, which is a false positive discovery. Uh, here is an illustration when we test 20 times on different colors of jelly bean and how they show a correlation with acne. One out of the 20 tests will show a significant correlation, even though it's purely uh, out of uh, uh, random noise. So uh, that's telling us whenever we do statistical tests, we want to control the overall type 1 error rate uh, in case there is an inflation, um, cumulative inflation by uh, the more uh, tests we do, the more likely we are going to see a significant result. At Open Door, we, um, the, the, uh, the problem came up uh, fre uh, frequently, specifically uh, for product improvement, sometimes we want to track multiple outcomes of interest, not just one. So when we do uh, want to evaluate uh, the effect of certain product change on you know, long-term long or short-term outcomes, we are encountering this problem. Or if we want to dissect the data set into multiple subgroups and do a statistical test uh, within each subgroup, we are encountering the same problem. And uh, sometimes we want to run an experiment with multiple treatment groups, not just one case versus one control group. When we have multiple treatments, uh, we want to test uh, each one compared to the other one, which one uh, give us the best lift. So all the scenario will generate this multiple hypothesis testing problem. If you look up the literature, you will find out statistically there are ways to control this uh, this type of uh, type one error rate inflation by adjusting your p-value. For example, some common method you will see a buffer running correction or Holmes method false discovery rate control. Those are all uh, thoroughly researched uh, 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 statistical methodology to control this problem. However, uh, practically we have some objections when using this type of uh, statistical method. People will say, uh, p-value adjustment are actually pretty arbitrary by number of tests we, we are going to consider. How do you decide what's the correct number of tests we are going to adjust? Should we adjust um, tests we have done in the past? Should we adjust tests have been done in other teams, but not specifically uh, our teams? So uh, this number become very arbitrary and uh, sometimes uh, people will uh, use this uh, arbitrary concept to you know, falsely adjust the, the total number of tests. The other objection is when we reduce the type one error, we are inherently increasing our type two error rate, which means we don't have enough power to detect a significant true result, uh, which also means we are going to increase our total sample size. So, to solve this controversial problem, uh, as a data scientist, we come up with a very practical recommendation and the strategies, not only for researchers and the data scientists, but also for readers and the uh, 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 stakeholders who are going to review and uh, read those uh, reports. For example, we would recommend not just focus on interpreting uh, the p-value part, but also focus on the true magnitude or the effect size of the finding from the data. Uh, also, we want to uh, pay attention to the quality of the study and the data set. So focus on more uh, from the design and the data quality side uh, of the report and the study, not just uh, purely uh, based on uh, the p-value from the study. For researcher and the data scientist, we come up with a set of statistical methodology recommendations. For example, when handling correlated uh, outcome or uh, metrics, we have this uh, index method that can uh, utilize the correlated information from multiple outcomes, uh, try to aggregate the common information and then reduce the type one error rate. Or we have this uh, Bayesian multi-level modeling method. So completely move away from the frequentist p-value based uh, decision, uh, decision making process and then move to a more Bayesian probabilistic uh, recommendation uh, system. Practically, uh, I, I, we also give recommendation. One of my favorite recommendation is divide uh, the error rate into a family-wise uh, error rate control system. Uh, 
based on theoretical related test groups. Let's say you have two uh, set of tests, uh, three tests all measuring user satisfaction. You may have different metrics, but uh, you are going to run three tests. They are all follow uh, the user satisfaction category. You have another set of tests uh, which are testing the total error rate or page load speed, uh, which can fall into this safety metrics category. In this case, instead of splitting the total error rate uh, across the, all the tests equally, you can divide them by the two family. So each family can share their own uh, overall error rate. Now that's uh, just uh, one project data scientists uh, uh, working on at Open Door. I also want to uh, use this opportunity to, to introduce some of the other project uh, data scientists work with at Open Door. So why is Open Door investing so much on data quality and the uh, data rigorous and the data science role? Uh, it's because Open Door business is really unique and uh, it's very complex. Uh, if you think about housing transaction, it's very important and uh, maybe you only do one or two housing transaction in your whole life. So it's very complex, the transaction process. Uh, second challenge is our data is super sparse due to the, it's a rare event. We don't have repetitive uh, interaction with the customer. Uh, sometimes we only serve the customer one or twice uh, in their whole lifetime. So it uh, brings uh, a lot of analytical and the statistical challenge. We don't have the luxury of the uh, e-commerce or internet type of traffic. So a lot of the decision we are making uh, need to depend on statistical inference and the statistical expertise at Open Door. The last point is optimization. We want to produce the best user uh, customer experiment with um, a constrained amount of time and the constrained cost. So we want to uh, work within limited costs and uh, trying to optimize within, within the constraint and uh, produce the best customer experience. Uh, I'm going to share with you some other typical project uh, our data scientist team uh, work with. For example, in the buyer team, we study the local housing demand and the price elasticity, and we feed that information to our resale pricing team in order to better or more accurately uh, price the resale price for, for the home we acquired. In the seller team, we try, we try to uh, target specific seller, gro uh, seller group and uh, provide more uh, customized seller experience by uh, serving based on seller input, their characteristic, uh, provide a different type of unique service. So that's all optimization model uh, our data scientist team work on. From pricing side, we want to understand how to combat risk, adverse selection and the competition and the build uh, all the factor and the macro information into our pricing model. Uh, so that's the overall introduction for the data science team and the, some of the cool project we are working on. I'm going to introduce our next speaker, which is Maggie. Maggie is a senior software engineer on the sales and the support team at Open Door. Maggie has been a part of a wide range of projects at, at Open Door. And recently she co-designed and is currently implementing a new uh, role-based access control system for the company internal tooling. Outside of work, Maggie is a competitive swing dancer. Welcome Maggie. Thank you, Amy. Hi, I'm Maggie, and I'm going to talk about role-based access control at Open Door. In this talk, I'll go over what role-based access control is generally, what the design goals were for Open Door's RBAC system, technical design of our RBAC system, and some challenges and recommendations from our experience. If you aren't familiar with the term role-based access control, I can almost guarantee you are familiar with the concept. At a high level, in an RBAC system, what a user can and cannot access is based on their assigned role. There are three main data entities, users, roles, and permissions. Let's take GitHub as an example. Hey, I, real quick, can you share your slides? I don't think we see them. Oh. You know, it just goes to show 
No worries. All preparation in the world. Perfect. Let's take GitHub as an example. Can you guys see my slides now? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Um, GitHub. Uh, I am part of the backend infra team, which means that my role is an administrator on the web repo, which means that I can access admin features like merging pull requests with all, without all of the, chest, the checks passing. For Opendoor's role-based access control system, we had some very specific design goals. As a result of going public in 2020, we needed to comply with the Financial Operations Act, widely known as SOX. SOX compliance can mean different things for different companies, but the most pertinent part of SOX compliance for Opendoor was showing that only authorized employees were allowed to perform financially sensitive actions. Other goals for the system included easy use and maintenance for engineers, straightforward management for IT, and peace of mind for security. Security was a bigger concern than usual for our new RBAC system because we would be trusting the system with protecting financially sensitive actions from both internal and external users. We wanted employees to follow a clear process to change role and, and permission assignments. In our design, we assign roles to users in Okta, an industry standard authentication and authorization tool, bringing a lot of advantages for security and IT. We already moved towards using Okta for authentication for our internal tooling and this change felt like a natural extension of prior work. We store our permission to role mapping in a separate service config, which means that changes were handled through GitHub. It also means that for every API call, we call our role to permission service gatekeeper to check the user's roles. API endpoints are tied with permissions directly in the code, which is easy for engineers to implement and maintain. And once we get the user's roles from gatekeeper, we check whether they match the permissions for that API endpoint. Our biggest challenge for this project were encountered in the, in the design phase. We had a big challenge understanding what SOX compliance would mean for Opendoor and what actions we should take to limit access first. Like many companies, Opendoor has a few different deployment environments for our internal tooling. And one of our biggest questions was whether we could limit our RBAC gating to one of these deployment environments. After further exploration, we discovered that that was not the case and this significantly changed our design requirements. Additionally, this project stress tested how major engineering design decisions are made at Opendoor. Getting alignment on the critical design decisions was especially difficult given the lack of clarity on the scope of the project. If you happen to find yourself in a similar situation in the future, we recommend that you clarify and align on your RBAC project goals before you start the design process. We also recommend involving cross-team stakeholders early in the project and communicating to engineering management early and often if the project needs more resources. Thanks. The next speaker is Sumeda. Sumeda is a senior software engineer at Opendoor on the Seller Core Experience team. She builds out various tools and interfaces to help customers find a home selling experience which best suits their needs, whether that is listing or selling their home using Opendoor services. These range from dashboards to see their home value to a digital closing experience. She also manages and maintains Opendoor's design systems and React UI component libraries, which power open door, the Opendoor site and admin tools. Outside of work, Sumita is an avid baker and always trying to, fit, to find ways to fit more plants into her environment. Welcome, Sumita. Hi. Thanks, Maggie. Sorry for taking over a little bit early. <laughs> Uh, Role-based access control and SOX compliance are so important now that we're a public company. So it's really great to kind of see what, you know, went, be went on behind the scenes to make that all happen. Um, hi, I'm Smeta. Um, so on the seller team at Opener, we actually build out a variety of customer experiences and dashboards, which span from educating the customer on buying, a, buying and or selling their home all the way through actually like digitally closing on their home. As you can imagine, the UI gets increasingly more complex as the functionality gets more and more important. This means that customers need to be 100% sure that they're, that they're trusting their home and their money with Opendoor and that the site that they're on and that they're signing contracts on is legit. Um, delivering on these expectations while continuing to add new features requires pretty thorough testing. And it also helps us as a company build trust, brand, and consistency across all of our customer experiences. 
um, with different UIs, it's not as straightforward to catch a lot of UI changes and things like colors, font sizes, mobile responsiveness, and all those like little nitty gritty things aren't as easy to catch. Especially when there's a ton of engineers working on the same UI, it's pretty easy to miss if one person's change unintentionally impacts another one's experience. I spend a lot of time personally staring at my team's customer experiences. So I tend to notice some pretty nitpicky changes, but that doesn't mean that an engineer from another team has the UI memorized the same way. This is amplified even more with design systems and shared component libraries, um, because a lot of these components that are changing are used across tons of different experiences. At Opendoor, we have a bunch of micro front ends and a single change to a shared component, like the button here on the left-hand side, can have an unintended side effect on pretty much every experience at Opendoor without people really realizing it. UI regression tests are one of the ways that we found to actually help mitigate a lot of these um, unintentional UI side effects. So it allows us to compare screenshots of the UI or visual snapshots against a predefined baseline. It really helps us catch a lot of these really nitpicky things. And it also helps us QA the user experience in a way um, a lot easier and it helps us QA it against design expectations. Additionally, we can also develop a lot of these components in a completely isolated environment with, um, without any kind of network calls. So we don't have to worry about data loading or any of that. We can really focus just on the UI and you know, the pixel perfect stuff. Um, at OpenDoor, we use a combination of two frameworks called Percy and Storybook, which are two different open source tools that enable the development and documentation of UI components and also automating a lot of that UI screenshot testing. Um, in this example, you can see that like we have it, uh, we have a dashboard being rendered, but what we can actually turn this like pretty simple unit test into something that renders a component. Um, if you want, you can have it mock out some data calls, do all that stuff, and you can actually render that and test it against a specific um, baseline. UI regression testing or UI visual screenshots don't actually replace your standard unit tests or smoke tests or integration tests. Since those actually validate the expected behavior and experiences, it's um, this is really just to focus on the nitpicky UI things. So things like um, you know, like the CSS changes that I mentioned earlier. Um, also, you have all those other tests to validate behavior, such as like whether or not a toast pops up when you when a user clicks a button, or that you know typing in an typing something in an input field will actually make will enable a button somewhere else. Um, and this isn't just useful for engineering. It's been um, extremely helpful while QA new features and designs. It's also greatly reduced the amount of back and forth we have with, as we're launching new features with design, where we're like, you know, this is a little bit off, this pixel is a little bit off. Um, we can, just, as we're developing, we can send these over and we can make sure that any future changes isn't actually breaking that experience. All of these things combined allow us to build really beautiful and seamless experiences for customers and really make one of the most expensive and biggest transactions in people's lives a little less scary. Um, now I'll turn it over to Heather for our next segment. Heather brings 22 years of engineering experience to Opendoor, having led teams at Lyft, Capital One, and Blackboard. At Opendoor, she leads the engineering organization focused on the core product experience for home sellers, along with growth initiatives and retail partnerships. Heather lives in Berkeley, California with her husband and two boys. Welcome, Heather. Thank you, Sameda. And, you know, thank you so much for um, presenting on the storybook and Percy testing. I've personally seen the impact of that on our quality and productivity. And you know, I'm really excited to host this next session with uh, which will be a Q&A with our panelists. So I'd like to invite everyone back to come back on the screen. And while they're doing that, you know, I wanted to talk about um, leadership in this Q&A. And, and as an engineering leader, I believe we should be creating opportunities for leadership at all levels, whether you're an intern or a staff engineer. You know, and one of the things I love about Open Door is seeing that demonstration of leadership every day with every single person I work with. Um, and you know, I've personally seen that leadership demonstrated by these particular panelists. So um, I'd love to ask each of you first, what do each of you believe has contributed 
to your ability to demonstrate leadership at Open Door. And I think we have everybody on now. So Morgan, maybe we'll start with you. Sure. Thank you, Heather. I appreciate the question. Um, You know, there's two things that come to mind for me. The first piece I would say is, it sounds pretty simple, but I have practiced the art of assuming good intent at all costs in every scenario. Um, Because I think sometimes in leadership, Um, it can be quite easy to become a little bit defensive because you want to do well and you want to show up correctly. And so I think if you if you operate from a perspective of no matter what's thrown at me, I'm going to assume that this was thrown at me with good intention. It will help calm that defensiveness so that you can respond in an appropriate manner. So that's the first piece. The second piece I would say is The team that I'm on specifically has done a really good job of teaching me how to lead collaboratively. Um, I think it's super important that whenever you are leading, whether it's a new project, whether it's a team, whether you're just building new uh, relationships with other partners throughout your business, it is, it's vital, it's paramount that you don't look at yourself as the single source of truth but rather you work in conjunction with the parties that are involved to make sure that you all are leading in the same direction. So the two that I would say is assuming good intent and leading collaboratively. Yeah, it's so true and really insightful, Morgan. I really appreciate your your thoughts. How about you, Annie? Hey guys, Um, I am unable to start my video, but uh, I'm here. Um, If Whoever is hosting can start my video for me. That'd be great. If not, no worries. Uh, Oh, here we go. All right, I'm back. Um, This is such a great question. You know, I think that my ability to demonstrate leadership at Open Door has really been stemmed from uh, as a designer and as a design leader, kind of related to what I was talking about in my uh, talk, really helping everyone at the organization really obsess over problems, over ideas, and really, you know, one of the uh, key values that we have at Open Door now is to start and end with the customer. And I think a lot of being about a designer is building that empathy and really obsessing over our customers. And that ultimately gets you to obsess over problems rather than solutions. So I'd say that's one aspect. And the other aspect is really keeping in mind that execution matters. It's not all about like coming up with cool ideas and like, you know, cool, cool visions and stuff that at the end of the day, like, you know, we need to keep a high bar for what we do. And so execution really amounts to making sure that teams are working really collaboratively, that like designers and PMs and engineers are working collaboratively and are in sync. And we do these workshops to make sure that people are in sync. Um, so I think, you know, the the dual sense of just, making sure that we're obsessing over customers and problems and also making sure that we're really executing to high level um, is kind of my uh, leadership style. Yeah, yeah, that's really great. And I, I agree, I've seen so much of that at Open Door, the collaboration that, you know, especially collaboration that you facilitated and uh, it's certainly a differentiator, I think how much Open Door obsesses over their customers. So it's, that's great. Um, Maggie, what are your thoughts on the topic? Yeah, I feel like one of the best things about working at Open Door is that there's no shortage of good ideas, only people to make those ideas a reality. Um, Open Door's business has a lot of different facets and there are opportunities everywhere for taking on more responsibility. So like for, for me personally at Open Door, I just feel like getting more leadership opportunities and developing myself as a leader has mostly just been a matter of raising my hand. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very true. And I think the business complexity at Open Door is really interesting and, and absolutely creates those opportunities. I love that. Um, Amy, how have you experienced leadership at Open Door? I, yeah, not only the complexity of the type of uh, problem open door trying to solve, but also uh, I would say it, it, uh, I buyer this whole industry is still very new and young, like a, a startup feel when you join open door compared to I used to work at a more mature, uh, larger technical company. I, I can definitely feel the, the, the culture difference here. Uh, uh, it, not everything is perfect. It's set up already. There, you don't see uh, maybe a perfect data engineering team prepare perfect data. 
that uh, can be consumed by data science team. A lot of time you need to do the heavy lifting and uh, see where the gap is, where the problem is, not just uh, complaining for the missing pieces, but actually can you know, propose a solution and uh, just do it. So that naturally create the gap, uh, created the opportunity for emerging new leader, especially for me uh, coming from uh, IC now transitioning into a leadership role. The other uh, thing I want to mention is this uh, one team, one dream uh, culture it is this core value for open door. So when you see an uh, area for improvement, even not within your immediate team, maybe it's a cross-functional team, uh, but you can contribute there's nobody will you know, stop you and say, you know, just do your own team's work. There's always collaboration opportunity and uh, you can just uh, extend your influence uh, outside your immediate team and the service area. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's spot on and the sense of ownership that everyone has and, and doing that as a team is, is just, it's so much more powerful and becomes real multiplier. Um, how about you, Samita? How, have you, how do you feel like uh, the open door uh, experience has allowed you to demonstrate your leadership? Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, one of the, um, honestly, one of the best examples of like how, one of the best ways I've been able to actually demonstrate leadership and grow is, um, every week, every other week, we have these kind of architectural meetings. And it's really allowed me to not just have ownership of the code and like the, the surface areas that my team operates in, but really expand that beyond that. And um, gives us a lot of opportunities to propose and facilitate a lot of discussions that have impact beyond just your specific team. And so really getting to um, establish that level of ownership at a much, much, much broader level and really expand your impact across the company. Um, yeah, that's been like one of the most unique and interesting ways that I've been able to really develop leadership here. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that uh, with a lot of people. And, you know, we, we really want to include everybody in that process. And um, I think it's really elevated a lot of amazing ideas, much more long term thinking and um, has really push the, the organization to the next level. So yeah, that's a great example. You know, clearly each of you have developed deep domain expertise. And so, you know, on top of that, each of you have considered the direction in which you grow and whether it's moving to people management or focusing on deepening your multiplying impact. So were there specific things you considered in order to decide which direction to take your career? And maybe we'll start with Maggie. Thanks, Heather. Um, I have been thinking a lot about going into people management. Um, so I'm working on that transition right now. About a year ago, I got the opportunity to be a tech lead for a team. And I found that performing the leadership role was a lot more rewarding than being an IC. Um, so I've, I've really been taking on pursuing that and getting involved with the crafting of our, like, our transition role and um, starting to craft like those documents. That's great. Yeah. And I think, you know, your selflessness that you demonstrate every day is really uh, a, a huge impact to the rest of the team. And so it's really great to see you moving into people management. Amy, how about you? You mentioned you were recently um, transitioning more from IC to leadership. What were some specific things you considered? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I would uh, um, summarize the decision-making process. In I, I consider two factors. One is what my strength is um, to what my passion uh, is about. Three is well, what the company goal is. I think the perfect perfect position is the all the three factor can align the best. Sometimes what you want to do doesn't really align with the, the bigger picture what the company uh, well want to go or the the long term goal. I have seen 
sometimes, especially uh, technical, uh, very deep technical person, they uh, just want to utilize specific uh, technology or toolings, uh, but uh, that doesn't necessarily solve the immediate uh, business problem. Uh, so that it's a misalignment. I think the perfect position where when everybody try to evaluate what's the best role is, uh, do you see an opportunity or uh, can the next position that help you align the three factor better? For me, I joined Open Door a uh, relatively recent, uh, last, uh, end of last year, I joined as a senior IC. Now I'm in the uh, tech lead position. Uh, so I, I enjoy my current position. It gave me both the freedom to do some uh, project uh, roadmap planning, uh, management, and also uh, stay close to the technology uh, while I'm still uh, learning about the business. But uh, eventually, uh, yeah, based on uh, what how I feel, how I evaluate the three-factor alignment, I, I will make my decision for the next step. Yeah, that's great. It's so great that you've gotten these opportunities so quickly and yet, you know, you, you can always change your mind and feel supported and, and how you grow there. I think that's great. Sumeda, um, how have you thought about your career direction? Yeah, um, for me, it came down to as simple as I really just like writing code. Um, as many as that sounds, um, writing code and like really diving into spending a lot of time diving into our customer experiences, whether that's from like a product design or even engineering standpoint. Um, obviously, as I grow more as like a senior IC, it's definitely less about doing a lot of the nitty gritty code myself, um, but really figuring out how I can um, how I can better enable those around me to accomplish our, whether it's technical goals or OKRs or things like that. And then also how can I set some technical standards around best practices while really starting to think a lot more big picture about our systems. And those are the challenges that really excite me and um, maybe really want to go down the route of staying, um, going, becoming a more senior IC for sure. That's great. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's hard to, to debate, you know, not liking to <laughs> code. <laughs> Um, Annie, you, you've provided leadership at Open Door for quite a while. Uh, how have you thought about your career direction? Yeah, so um, I started off at Open Door a long time ago um, as a senior designer, and I was with, as an IC, a senior IC, and I worked on pretty much the end to end experience and various parts of the experience. Um, and then, you know, about two and a half years ago, I moved to management. Um, and I think one guiding principle that I've really had about my career has always just been to optimize for growth because I am happiest when I am learning and challenged. And so I was honestly really happy being an IC. I love designing and learned a lot, especially going from designing just digital experiences at my previous gigs to Open Door, where I was really challenged in designing like these online and offline experiences. And as Open Door grew, I got the opportunity to manage. Um, and when there was the opportunity, I was actually really excited. And I actually told my manager that I wanted this opportunity. And I think that's one thing that I would advise everyone to is like, I actually don't believe there is a certain stereotype, you know, a, for um, ICs, like if you are this way, you, you're a great IC or if this way you're a great manager. And if you're curious and you're, you wanna grow into one or the other, make it known to your manager. Might not be that like immediately you can do it, but um, that's one thing I always tell, especially females, is like I think, you know, just, just tell, like if there isn't a right or wrong answer. If you're curious about something, just to say that. Cause that's ultimately how I ended up in management. I was really curious about it. I saw an opportunity, I told my manager um, and he helped me um, you know, work my way through it. And as our company grew, I got to scale our team and I've really found a lot of enjoyment in supporting my team and not being kind of like the hands-on IC. Um, I also haven't ruled out though that maybe in the future or next gig, I want to be an IC again. Um, and so I believe that there's a lot of fluidity to this. Yeah, that's excellent advice. I, I wholeheartedly agree. I have uh, similar experiences. Morgan, um, you inspired us with just your self-awareness um, talk. Uh, how do you think personally about your own career direction? Sure. 
Well, let me just tell you, Heather, uh, my career has been nothing short of a jungle gym. <laughs> I have been a senior manager, an entry level IC, a senior IC, a lead back to management, back to IC. All of that's happened like in the span of about six years. <laughs> Uh, and in different sectors too, whether it's sales, whether it's marketing and advertising, leadership and development, or learning and development rather. So my decision-making process, generally speaking, is with regard to um, the skills that I'd like to nurture. That's basically how I base my decision. So the trajectory of my career, it's based on the skill sets and the acumen that I hope to cultivate at a specific time. And whatever those skill sets are, I am going to look for a position or a role in which it will specifically help me get to that next step. And I'm less concerned about what the title is and more concerned about what the end result could potentially be. Yeah, that's great advice. It's sometimes hard to take the time to even think about that, but I think it's really important. Well, I appreciate um, all of the panelists' thoughtful answers, and um, that's a wrap for the presentation portion. Um, yeah, I also wanted to thank the Girl Geek team for all you do for the community, and um, I'm going to put my LinkedIn uh, into the chat. Feel free to connect with me and reference this event um, if you want to hear more about Open Door. So I'll invite Angie back on the screen to share the next portion of the breakout sessions. Awesome. Thank you all for sharing your insights and your journeys with us. Um, really enjoyed all the talks and the conversation about this is what leadership looks like. So we will be sharing some open door jobs via email. Um, keep an eye out for that. That's actually an event survey and also links to the open door jobs.